Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sylvain Geyer and I'm the head of corporate medical marketing of Siguaris Group. I'm extremely pleased to welcome you to this already fourth Siguaris Medical Online Hub webinar with the topic lymphedema diagnosis and treatment. Uh, first of all, I have the great pleasure to introduce our principal moderator of today, Professor Sergio Giannisini. Sergio, I think it's needless to introduce you the conventional way, as the majority of attendees will know you already from several projects and activities you were running worldwide. Instead of just reading down a list of your qualifications achievements, I would like to tell you and the group what impresses me most about Sergio Cenesini. We all know you are a great speaker and moderator, obviously one of the reasons why we invited you. But what really impresses me are your incredible networking abilities. I'm always amazed how strong you are in bringing the right people together at the right time to create and achieve great outcome with a strong focus on education and training. Education and training are also the main goals of the Siguaris Medical Online Hub. And therefore, I'm extremely pleased to have you with us today. Sergio, thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much to all of you. And now I have the great pleasure to announce a very special guest for the Siguaris group. It's the first time uh, that he's appearing in Siguaris Medical Online Hub. And I'm extremely pleased that he made it possible to interrupt his holidays just to join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the new Siguaris group CEO, Dr. Sagu Ha. Sagu, please. Yes, hello. Thank you very much, Silva. I hope uh, you can hear me. Very well. Thank you. So uh, welcome from my side and uh, from uh, the Sivaris group to this MOH, to this medical online hub. And uh, it's a really great pleasure for me uh, to, to join this meeting. My name is Saguha, and I'm uh, the group CEO of Sigvaris group since June, 2021. And before I've worked in the field of medical technology and healthcare for almost 30 years, as an engineer for products and solutions for, for interventional cardiology and radiology, and then in different uh, management positions in international companies like Boston Scientific or Philips, uh, where I was CEO of Philips Switzerland during the last uh, three years. And now I'm really very happy to join uh, the Sigvaris Group as Group CEO. The MOH is, is our commitment as Siguaris Group to supporting and collaborating with the global and regional medical communities. And I really would like to thank everyone involved, the speakers, expert panelists, and the hundreds of participants from all over the globe. The Siguaris Group company mission is to help people feel their best every day. And especially in the field of lymphedema and lipedema, we want to raise the awareness together with you for these disorders that are sometimes not known, not fully recognized and not treated sufficiently. We want to contribute to improve this situation by facilitating the international medical discourse involving healthcare providers worldwide, giving free access to medical education so that we can share the knowledge and the experiences of our global network for the benefit of the patients. As you know, we are offering product solutions for these disorders, but more than that, we regard ourselves as a part of the medical community. This is our motivation why we are committed to the medical education and exchange on the global level and the reason why we have opened our treatment center recently, the Siguaris Edema Institute in Melbourne, Australia. To put it short, the patient is and should always be in the center of our attention. And with this focus on the patient, I'm really looking forward to an inspiring discourse and wish all of you uh, a great MOH. So thank you very much. And I hand over to Silvan. Thank you very much, Saku, for this introduction. And uh, I will just hand over to Sergio for the introduction of the expert group and uh, also of the first speaker. Thank, thank, you so much. Much. thank you so much, Sylvain, and thank you so much uh, to all uh, Sigbaris and uh, first of all to all the ones who with me volunteered today for creating this uh, top uh, experts uh, faculty. Like uh, 
to just spend one word of appreciation for the vision of uh, this uh, project as is bringing together industries and top experts in a moral way and it's very good that, that the new heads of uh, the group is actually an engineer because we need this technical expertise that is combined with the clinical expertise we are trying to put there. I really appreciate your introduction, Sylvain, about our networking activities with BWIN. I hope you equally appreciated all the efforts we tried to do in publishing data on compression and related topics in venous and lymphatics, and today focusing also on lipedema because uh, we are here to protect, first of all, patients, uh, first of all, from uh, uncertified products, first of all, from uh, not evidence-based data. So I really look forward for uh, enjoying greatly a wonderful panel of experts that I will introduce one by one during the webinar, starting from a person I truly consider one of my scientific heroes, Professor Roxon from uh, the Lymphatic Research and uh, Medicine Group at Stanford University will uh, start with his first uh, talk, uh, focusing indeed uh, on uh, lipedema with a touch also of lymphedema, I would say. Thank you so much, Sergio, and, and thank you, Sylvan, for the uh, introduction as well and, and, and for the opportunity to speak today and to my many friends on the panel. Uh, I'll take just a moment to share my screen. Um, where is... slideshow. All right. Um, so I'm going to start on somewhat of a theoretical uh, basis because I'm going to be presenting some research data. Um, some of what I say clinically about lipedema, there are lots of controversies in this field, so perhaps not all the panelists will agree with my sentiments, but I will share my vision of lipedema uh, that led to this research proposal, and we hope something that will uh, represent a useful uh, tool moving forward for lipedema. And we feel that the results of this study uh, in fact, underscore the notion, uh, which is a, a hypothesis that uh, I and others have shared for a long time, that lipedema is in fact uh, a lymphatic abnormality. Now, we're all aware that the lymphatic problems in general um, share the, the issue of uh, poor recognition from the uh, clinical community. This is certainly true even for a very common condition like lymphedema. And when we start to talk about lipedema, the name recognition becomes even uh, more uh, suspect, and these patients often uh, lack recognition by the clinicians who are taking care of them. So it behooves us to understand as much as we can and then uh, disseminate the information so that these patients can receive care. Now, um, Lipedema, as we'll see, in, in my opinion, is a lymphatic defect, but it also can be considered a fat disorder. And fat is a touchy subject, and it's a subject that uh, uh, embraces both normal and abnormal biology. So we certainly understand that fat distribution is age dependent and biology dependent and somewhat uh, gender dependent uh, or sex dependent. And uh, in lipedema, of course, we have an abnormal adipose biology, but it's interesting to contemplate the fact that this adipose abnormality is shared with the other lymphatic defects and the other problems that create chronic edema. So certainly in the adult uh, human population, um, constitutional obesity is a significant problem. It's a growing problem, certainly in the Western world, and I don't mean to use a pun there, um, but it, it really is, is reaching its own epidemic proportions, certainly in the United States, and I believe uh, in Europe as well, and other parts of the world. Uh, and here, uh, we need to distinguish constitutional obesity from the kind of adipose hypertrophy that occurs in chronic lymphedema. Here you're seeing a patient with uh, late stage two uh, lymphedema of the lower extremities, and you can see um, the prominent um, uh, adipose component of the presentation, which contrasts with this somewhat classic but very extreme example of lipedema 
where again, there is a significant component of adipose hypertrophy, but also the characteristic cuffing and the uh, sparing of the feet and the very symmetric and smooth form of adipose hypertrophy that uh, typically characterizes um, at least the mainstream presentation of this disease. And finally, we have the problem of stage four lipedema, which is often uh, called lipo lymphedema, in which lipedema has progressed to uh, evidence of failure of the larger collecting channels uh, for the lymphatics. And now we have a hybrid of the heretofore lipedema presentation with attributes of uh, secondary lymphedema as well. So these are the the overlapping presentations that we need to distinguish, and this represents the differential diagnosis that confronts a clinician who attempts to uh, assess and characterize these patients. So um, just uh, to highlight a little bit of the similarities and differences among these, and again, I recognize that some of what I will be discussing here uh, will overlap with uh, some of the clinical discussion as well, but uh, it's, I think it's important for uh, the context of the research that I'm going to be presenting. So uh, one of the issues to discuss, of course, is the fact that um, lipedema is es essentially exclusively a problem of women. We do see it very rarely in men, but in when it occurs in men, it does require a substrate of excess es estrogen production or some imbalance between estrogen and testosterone. Uh, so clearly there is a hormonal uh, substrate to the problem. In terms of um, the uh, presentation, um, of course, lipedema and lymphedema typically are going to be uh, primarily confined to the extremities, whereas in lifestyle obesity, the trunk is you know, very heavily uh, involved and perhaps is the central uh, portion of the adipose excess. Um, Lymphedema is the condition among these three that tends to be most asymmetric in its presentation. Lipedema is really remarkably symmetric in its involvement of both of the lower extremities or even all four extremities when that occurs. And that tends to be the case in constitutional obesity as well. Uh, pitting is only an attribute of those presentations that include uh, a chronic hydrostatic edema component, which typically would be lymphedema in its earlier stages. Uh, this quality is lost over time. Uh, and um, finally, the uh, changes or the differences in tissue turgor uh, mean that lymphedema is the entity that will present with the most firm nature of the tissues. Um, tenderness and um, pain are really an attribute primarily of lipedema. So these are some of the ways in which we recognize the and make the clinical distinctions uh, among these entities. And finally, to say that lymphedema is the entity that is most commonly associated with soft tissue infection. Now, there's also uh, a genetic component to this uh, entity of lipedema, although this is very poorly characterized at this point. But I want to point out that there is such an issue in lymphedema as well. The preponderance of lymphedema is secondary and is a consequence of uh, cancer therapeutics or other forms of iatrogenic uh, trauma and other traumas or directly of infection. But we do have this uh, component as well in lymphedema of the primary presentation, which has a genetic substrate. It's rare. It is considered a rare uh, disorder in the United States with less than 50,000 estimated uh, affected individuals. Uh, and I, I point this out only to say that in the lipedema population, uh, it is estimated that perhaps a half of these patients will point to a familial distribution of uh, similar problems. And the genetic underpinning um, is interesting. It's likely to be complex and it has yet to be uh, well-defined. So we do have a genetic component in both of these aspects. So uh, as we talk about lymphedema, we need to remember that it has um, stages as, as lymphedema does. Uh, it starts with an even skin surface and an enlarged hypodermis. Um, the skin pattern becomes uneven in stage two, and there is the development of these no nodular changes uh, and as well as palpable lipomas or angiolipomas. 
in stage three, these nodularities become quite large and uh, they ch severely change uh, the contour uh, of the limb, particularly on, in the thighs and around the knee. And finally, we have that stage four, which is called lipolymphedema. Now, the problem with lipedema is we have very little insight into the biology of this disease. Uh, partly this is a, a problem because we have no relevant animal models to study and no uh, bench science that we can really uh, heavily bring to uh, the table. And therefore, everything we understand about these patients is based upon uh, clinical observation. The diagnosis of this disease has been historically purely clinical. It relies upon a clinician's ability to use a history and a well-performed physical examination to work through the differential diagnosis. There are no characteristic imaging attributes of this disease. Histopathology, if we have it, is really not helpful. There's nothing characteristic about the morphology of these tissues that allows the diagnosis of lipedema. And finally, there have been no identified biomarkers, uh, which um, means that our framework for thinking about this disease is purely uh, theoretical. I think there are attributes uh, of the lymphedema presentation that overlap lipedema in its uh, pathogenesis. Um, this is a framework in which I think about lymphedema in which the inherent lymphatic dysfunction leads both to interstitial edema and immune dysfunction because of the immune uh, um, uh, traffic uh, attributes of the lymphatic circulation. These attributes in turn lead to chronic inflammation and recurrent infection, and all of these forces have an interplay to lead to progressive fibrosis and adipose deposition. Many of the same forces are interacting in lipedema, but uh, seemingly in a different orientation. And all of these interrelationships are quite hypothetical at this point, again, because we don't have a lot of scientific uh, insight into the true pathogenesis. Again, coming back to the problem of fat deposition, we do understand that in lymphedema, the vast preponderance of the volume increase in lymphedema is fat hypertrophy. You'll see in the, uh, in the second panel here that there is a 73% increase in the fat volume representing the majority of the increase in the lymphedematous limb compared to its normal contralateral control. There is some muscle hypertrophy as well, which probably reflects the increased uh, uh, weight of the affected limb and, and the response of that limb uh, to the need to remain functional, but there's very little change in bone volume. And um, by the time a lymphedema becomes well-established, the preponderance of the weight and, and size increase is fat rather than, than true fluid. Um, we do have surgical approaches to this kind of uh, fat hypertrophy, and, and uh, many are aware that um, the pioneering work of Hockham Brorsen in um, dry liposuction, a very specialized form of dry liposuction, will render the uh, limb basically uh, normal in size, uh, provided that adequate compression is utilized throughout. We also use a liposuction approach uh, in many uh, practice approaches to lipedema uh, uh, for lipedema. And in this case, we tend to rely upon tumescent liposuction because of its ability to preserve the underlying lymphatic architecture in theory, but simply remove some of the excess inflamed adipose tissue to reduce symptoms and improve mobility for the patient. Now, in terms of imaging, um, if, if I resort first to the animal model in which I've done much of my work, this is the equivalent of a lymphocytogram in a mouse tail. And you can see that the normal architecture of, uh, this would be considered the functional architecture of the lymphatics can be well demonstrated and the loss of that architecture and function in the presence of uh, lymphedema. When we do this uh, same approach in a human patient, we can demonstrate um, the pooling of uh, interstitial fluid uh, based upon so-called dermal backflow and diminished uh, ability to have transit of the material to the draining lymph nodes, which represents the uh, diagnostic hallmark of the imaging procedure. Uh, we can also look at the lymphatics in, in other uh, modalities in which we can see more of the um, smaller architecture of the lymphatics. And interestingly enough, 
Uh, of course, we can also demonstrate dermal backflow in lymphedema, but it has been well demonstrated in the past that there is a characteristic and distinct abnormality that can be seen in patients with lipidema indicating that there, indeed there may be a lymphatic substrate uh, to this problem. And this has, uh, the literature on this is small, but it is quite uh, characteristic uh, to say that uh, lymphatic defects can be demonstrated. Here's another example of uh, lipidema as compared to normal when we look at the microlymphatics by fluorescence imaging. So with that in mind, we really can't rely upon those imaging characteristics to make the diagnosis. So uh, I would like to turn my attention to the question of biomarkers and specifically uh, to look at lipedema within the uh, universe of lymphatic abnormalities. Um, thankfully, lipedema is getting increasing attention over the last five years, I would say. It is coming to clinical attention, certainly in the United States. Uh, the patients are, be, are uh, undertaking a certain kind of uh, self-promoted activism because they're very interested in achieving a proper diagnosis and proper treatment. So with that in mind, uh, we have completed a research project that was published in JCI Insight um, that has helped us to identify platelet factor four as a biomarker for lymphatic promoted disorders, including lipedema. So let me talk you briefly through the research approach and what we found. We decided to study plasma exosomes. Uh, exosomes are packets of biological material that are formed within cells of a variety of origins. Uh, that is, uh, these packets are lined by a membrane and they contain protein, lipids, RNA, and DNA. Uh, and these small packets can be created within the cell, extruded from the cell, and then circulate freely within body fluids to um, uh, take these biological messages to uh, remote sites. Um, we uh, chose to look at exosomes both in mouse models and in human materials in order to identify this biomarker. Um, once we isolated the exosomes, we performed mass spectrometry on the protein fraction from the exosomes and then validated our, uh, our findings through ELISA. In order to look at the mouse, we decided to um, use a couple of interesting models with regard to the presentation of lipedema and lymphedema. Uh, there is a one uh, model called a PROX1 haploinsufficient mouse in which one of the um, alleles for PROX1 is absent. And we know that this mouse model as, as in, in, in youth uh, does have defined lymphatic uh, abnormalities, although its phenotype is normal, but as it ages, it becomes obese because of the lymphatic defect and the, and the subtle leakage of lymph and chyle that leads to uh, obesity. Uh, so we have the ability to both look at the young mice and the old mice to look at the impact of the lymphatic defect as well as the adipose contribution as the mouse ages. In order to have a control for the obesity itself, uh, we had the ability to look at the OB-OB mouse, which uh, is known to have constitutional obesity uh, based upon a mutation in the leptin receptor, uh, but there is no lymphatic defect that is present in the OB-OB mouse, so we can look at the obesity factor alone. And finally, in the humans, we chose to look at normal controls, uh, a subgroup with lymphedema, a subgroup with lymphovascular disease, including primary lymphedema, and a subgroup uh, with lipedema. And we found that in aggregate, all of this data uh, led us to platelet factor four as a unifying uh, biomarker. So let me show you first the data from the PROX1 mice. Uh, you see on the left-hand panels, the, um, the findings in the young mice and the right-hand panels, the older mice. So the older mice are the ones that are obese. Uh, you can see that we saw 70 upregulated genes and 36 downregulated genes in this, uh, in this um, uh, subject uh, subgroup. Uh, all the uh, proteins listed in red are those that are shared by uh, the OB-OB mouse. And uh, platelet factor four, as we'll see, uh, came up as a very interesting and significantly upregulated uh, protein. So uh, this uh, represents the... Uh, um, 
characterization of the shared and non-shared um, protein changes in the various uh, subgroups that we saw. And so um, you can see that there are some shared uh, gene changes between the upregulated prox group and the OB upregulated prox group, same with the down, but there are uh, certainly a distinct number of uh, changes that we have to evaluate. So having um, identified the proteins of interest in the mice, we then turn to the human subjects to see where the overlap might be. And this is a, um, a just an overview of the 75 patients that we enrolled in this study uh, to isolate their exosomes and study them. Uh, you can see that we were looking at both upper and lower uh, involvement in the limbs in the case of lymphedema, uh, both unilateral and bilateral, spanning the spectrum of ISL stages for lymphedema, but most commonly, as we see clinically, stage two. We had a smattering of stage three and stage one. In lipedema, we purposefully excluded stage four uh, because we did not want to have the hybrid presentation of lymphedema and lipedema. And here you, at the bottom, you can see the various lymphatic disease uh, etiologies that were included. So really across the spectrum of the lymphatic uh, presentation and about half of these patients had uh, cancer related disease. So again, out of all of this work, we identified platelet factor four as the protein of interest. And uh, just to give you a little bit of overview for those that are not familiar with this protein, although it had some press uh, during the COVID pandemic because it, it is uh, observed to be increased in, uh, in presentation in the thrombotic disorders that accompany COVID, uh, unrelated to what we're talking about today. It is a chemokine released from the alpha granules of platelets. Uh, it promotes blood coagulation and plays a role in wound repair and inflammation. And here is uh, really the substrate, I think, of its role in lipedema and the other lymphatic uh, diseases. It inhibits angiogenesis and it's chemotactic for neutrophils, fibroblasts, and monocytes. That, again, I think is the central issue for these lymphatic disorders. It's bound to surface glycosaminoglycans on platelets, monocytes, and endothelial cells. Uh, it's an immunogenic target in prothrombotic disorders and with platelet activation as what would be seen, for example, in the COVID infection, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's increased a thousandfold higher than in plasma once the platelets are activated. Now, we decided to undertake a receiver uh, operator uh, characteristic curve or, or an ROC on this data. Um, for those of you that are aware of what the steps are involved in developing a clinical biomarker, fundamentally, we're looking for 90% specificity and or sensitivity in order to have utility uh, in its role as a biomarker. Uh, an ideal behavior, one that would be 100% specific and sensitive, of course, would have a rectilinear shape to the curve, uh, hugging the ordinate and, and coming across horizontally at the 100% line, but we're trying to asymptotically approach that. Uh, this would be a, a more or less a random relationship uh, where sensitivity and specificity are about 50%. So you can see that in, in our work, uh, for all of these entities, but specifically including lipedema, at least for specificity, we exceeded that 90% threshold, at least in this small patient population, suggesting that this is actually a biomarker that is useful, certainly in distinguishing lymphatic disease from constitutional obesity, and specifically when lipedema is the question at hand uh, to, to verify that this is uh, indeed lipedema. I think sensitivity has um, less application here because we're not so much trying to exclude a diagnosis as we are trying to um, specifically ratify a diagnosis. So to go back to the things I said initially, that the diagnosis of lipedema is purely clinical, no characteristic imaging attributes that we can rely upon clinically, uh, no historically identified biomarkers, no histopathology. I think we can now eliminate the biomarker statement because perhaps in the future we can rely upon this and other forms of biomarkers. So what do we do with this? Well, um, this is a very interesting uh, laboratory approach that requires very sophisticated, time-consuming, laborious 
uh, and expensive exosome purification, I think it is able to be exported to a commercial platform. But of course, we have to interest a commercial partner in, in undertaking that development so that this can become widely available and actually be used as a screening tool. I'm going to take just a moment at the end of the talk to highlight um, an interrelated project, what I hope is an interrelated project in my role as the um, uh, founder and chair of the Scientific Advisory uh, Committee of uh, the Lymphatic Education and Research Network, we have undertaken um, a project that's now more than 10 years old of creating an international registry for lymphatic diseases. And from the inception, we have had a heavy contribution of the lipedema population. Patients who participate in this uh, registry can enroll from anywhere in the world from a, a computer application with a uh, highly secure um, uh, URL uh, in which they can directly enter their uh, information, which becomes de-identified. They simply uh, utilize all of the information available to them about their own case, and it can be aggregated with uh, the information from all the other patients around the world to bring us more insights into these diseases, including limp, uh, lipedema. So this is the URL for any uh, patients and or clinicians that are interested in this project. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for the uh, invitation and for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Stanley, for this very interesting presentation. I'm sure we will have quite a lot of questions uh, <laughs> until they pop up. I would like to ask um, Khaled to show the, the poll questions that we have prepared for that. Um, the first question is uh, about the diagnosis of lipidema that can be confirmed. And you have the choice, uh, four choices here. One is right. Um, just make your choice and then we will look at the, at the feedback. In the meantime, any comments uh, regarding the presentation? So, Sylvain, allow me to take the time then to introduce uh, the expert panelists that we have with us uh, today, Professor Pinar Borman from Ankara University. I think it's a great choice to have multi-specialty approach and indeed she's representing physical medicine and rehab. And it's very important to have another huge representative with us, uh, Professor Andrei Zuber, and also a dear <coughs> friend from the Angiology Ward. And you know, I'd like to deeply thank Andrei for having been a wonderful representative of the lymphatic ward together with Professor Roxon in our Venus Ward on the pandemic time. So I leave the mic to you. If not, I have some comments to make. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Roxon, uh, for their uh, great study that uh, I believe it will uh, bring a, a, an important insight to the pathophysiology of lipedema. But I have some uh, questions uh, about this study that uh, in uh, lipedemia patients, I have read your uh, paper uh, a few hours ago, actually, uh, not in details, but uh, I just uh, found that um, in lipedema patients, uh, they are not pure lipedema patients. Most of them had venous uh, disorders, uh, like the percentage of uh, approximately 30% of them, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, hypothyroidism, and um, also deep vein vein venous thrombosis, which may uh, uh, have an impact on uh, the um, vasculature uh, status of these patients. Uh, can you comment on this, uh, Professor Raxon? Because they are not uh, pure lip lipedema patients. Uh, I think um, we cannot... Um, uh, for, in my opinion, uh, make sharp and definite conclusions for the uh, patients with lipedema, not lymphedema ones. So I think you're pointing out um, what is uh, really the problem for uh, biomedical research when we cannot resort to syngeneic uh, mouse strains and other animal models to look at pure biology of isolated disease. I, I think what you say about lipedema is true of any patient population that we study in any context. And uh, the important uh, point to be made about these lipedema patients is that they fundamentally shared the same comorbidities 
uh, in, in, in rough proportions to the lymphedema cohorts as well. Uh, of, uh, our no so-called normal subjects also, uh, and I didn't mention that we had normal controls for these biomarker analyses, they also shared some of these comorbidities in the absence of lipidema uh, and lymphedema. And finally, um, the uh, the the, lymph the the issue at hand is that many of these attributes were also present in the obese cohort that did not have a lymphatic defect. So really, what we're looking at is a subtractive phenomenon, in which what we're saying is that in the absence of a lymphatic diagnosis and or lipedema, assuming that you do or don't believe that 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 is a lymph lymphatic defect. Um, and certainly in the constitutionally obese individuals who lack that, uh, we do not see elevations of this biomarker. So the biomarker seems to have a distinct relationship to the form of inflammation that we are seeing in the lymphatic substrate, plus or minus the presence of these other comorbidities, which is not to say that these other comorbidities don't have the theoretical potential to also raise platelet factor four levels. Had we done this in a patient who was um, in the in the incubation phase of COVID, we might have seen elevation of platelet factor four as well. But um, looking at these very hybrid presentations of multimodal disease, we are able to distinguish the biochemical profile of the lymphatic cohort from normals and from constitutionally normal individuals um, with respect to lymphatic disease and or obesity um, with the presence of these other entities in place. And you do you have a, a comment as well, Andy? Professor Tsuba? Yes, it was a fantastic paper and fantastic talk and fantastic paper. It is the first biomarker that actually was, uh, this could be a real biomarker for uh, lipedema. Uh, actually, I actually had the same uh, question as Pinar uh, regarding the control group, regarding the obese patients. If uh, in the paper, the, the obese control group was relatively small. I, 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 I don't remember this, uh, less than 10 uh, patients in control. So do you think, uh, make, I'm asking because there's a significant overlap between uh, obesity and uh, uh, lipedema. Majority of lipedema patients are in fact obese and uh, in clinic it's very difficult to, uh, sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish if it's pure obesity or this obesity lipedema because even obese, uh, purely obese people with fat legs will have pain in the legs for instance and some other problems. So uh, the biomarker would really help but my question, so my, going back to my question, uh, do you think that making this control group of really obese people with BMI of 40 or more would be would be helpful because they all also have some kind of inflammation in 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 in, in their fatty tissue? So that's that's my concern <laughs> and question. Well, I agree, Andre. I, I have lots of concerns and questions as well because this was really a pilot uh, study that was meant to hybridize mouse work with human, uh, I think it's an interesting lead. And we clearly we need a much larger study uh, and, and, and with, you know, with more well-defined subgroups. I share absolutely everything that you're saying. In a, in a pragmatic context, what we face in the United States, and we're outliers in, for most of the world in that we, we don't have good uh, you know, medical support beyond uh, commercial uh, third-party payers. Um, what becomes a pragmatic question for these patients, and in my lipedema patient uh, group, uh, the majority of them, I would say, have constitutional obesity as well as the lipedema presentation. The third-party payers are extraordinarily reluctant to pay for cosmetic uh, liposuction. So therefore, those that support tumescent liposuction for lipedema want some evidence that this is truly a disease that they're treating. And this is where I think the biomarker approach would be very useful is to say this is constitutional obesity plus and or we need to find out that constitutional obesity beyond a certain threshold creates enough inflammation that maybe we lose the specificity of, of the biomarker. I think it's, we were lucky 
with a small number of patient subgroups, we were able to create an ROC that, that meets criteria for clinical utility, but it certainly needs to be validated. And most importantly, I would really love to, uh, to recruit a commercial uh, partner in this so that we could actually bring it to scale and, and do it in a more relevant clinical manner instead of this very laborious you know, exosome purification that we had to go through to do the study. Now, partly we had to do that because the concentration of exosomes in the mouse plasma is really low. You know, I mean, the concentration of the proteins is really low. So we needed some way to hyper-concentrate so we could uh, make the, uh, the observations. But yes, your, your points are absolutely well taken. And I don't pretend that this is the end of the story. This is the first paragraph of the first chapter. Okay. So so then just a quick comment from me regarding this factor, because we identified in platelet-derived growth factor another biomarker for venous disease. So it sounds like a really similar to me the way potentially the endothelium is reacted to inflammation. Do you see any potential correlation with endothelial inflammation and the release of these platelet factors or not? Because we really found an association between hemodynamics parameters and platelet-derived growth factors. Oh, I think so. I think these factors bind to uh, lymphatic endothelium. And so they, they certainly can... In, in addition to simply being a, an attribute, a byproduct, if you will, they may actually you know, play an active role in, in, in disease promotion. I think it's very much worthwhile um, to, to pursue this. And, and, and of course, once you start talking about the venous world, then you're talking about the lymphatic world as well. You know? so, That's where I wanted to go, indeed. <laughs> indeed. So just one question from the audience, and then I see also in the chat you have a other questions if you want to answer to that later on uh, in written form. But from uh, the question and answer box, Joe uh, Varane is asking, is it uh, known if PF4 is also possible biomarker in constitutional obesity? That is the question. Well, the not known, not known, but from our data. And again, Anje um, really highlighted the fact that the, the sample sizes for all of these groups is relatively small. We did see a distinction where the constitutionally obese, if they did not have clinical attributes or a clinical diagnosis of lymphedema slash lipedema, they did, they had normal PF4 levels. So we need to look, um, we used a threshold of a BMI of 30, which is the the epidemiological definition, if you will, of, of obesity. But as Dr. Shuba pointed out, um, you know, maybe there are thresholds above which the inflammatory nature of obesity itself becomes important. So we maybe need to stratify patients into deciles of uh, BMI and see if there is a threshold above which PF4 might become a little bit more important uh, clinically. Thank you so much, Stan, and thank you so much for the brilliant lecture. And if you have time to answer in the chat, because they put it in the chat, not in uh, the question and answer. So please remember to write in uh, the chat your questions and uh, make sure, Stan, uh, you report also the website of your initiative of November 12. That is, of course, something we highly recommend everybody to follow with their research uh, network. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Sylvain, now I think you have a poll to show. Yes, I think we could. Uh receive the poll results now just to have a quick look at that okay so the majority is really uh, looking at history and physical examination um, I think this is uh, the right answer also Stanley <laughs> and uh, no surprise by this so the, the the your presentation was well received in this case great okay I think with this we can continue we with the second we are perfectly on time indeed to fly, great. to fly virtually to Europe, in particular Germany, in particular <laughs> the House of uh, Lymphedema Management, I would say, Phil the Clinic and uh, the European Center of Lymphology with Professor Tobias Persch will uh, tell us about the need of finding consensus, I would say, on lymphedema. Mm -hmm. Tobias, the mic is yours. Thanks for your nice introduction, Tetsu, just to check. Can you hear me? Um, we can hear I'm... you, we can see you, but we cannot see the, the slides. So you have to share your screen. Second. Meanwhile, I will take this time to, to dive a little bit more in the topic I was saying to you, Stan, because it has been a very long road, the one of the PDGF. So I will really send you the, the paper because I think that might be a common point once again in veins and lymphatics. Now we have uh, the document. 
ready. So we can see my presentation now, and yes. you can hear me. Perfect. So well, thanks again. And um, when I now just read the title of Dr. Roxton's talk, um, now we know lipidema is a lymphatic disease. I thought I would have to change the title of my lecture. Now we know lipidema is not a lymphatic disease. Uh, I have great respect for Dr. Roxton's life work and for his tremendous expertise in lymphedema. However, my understanding of lymphedema is entirely different from that of Dr. Roxton's. But I'm sure both Dr. Roxton's and I take a sporting view on this debate. <laughs> um, now, those of you who know a little bit about this field will probably heard about the debates, these debates within the lymphedema community. And of course, that discussion also will be part of my lecture. I will try my best to clarify what lipidema is and moreover, what lipidema is not. I divided my presentation in three acts. Act one, why we needed this paradigm shift. Now, Dr. Roxon is not alone in his belief that lipidema is a lymphatic disease. Also, a few other colleagues from the United States believe in the traditional view of lipidema, believe that lipidema is an edema disease and as a consequence, they recommend MLD for patients with lipidema to stimulate the lymphatic flow and to reduce edema. And according to these colleagues, fluid edema should be responsible for the pain experienced by lipidema patients. But if these statements are true, ladies and gentlemen, if there's really edema and lipidema, edema which is, respons which is responsible for the experienced pain, how do you explain why patients with lymphedema of the legs or of the um, Abdominal, um, of the abdominal wall and the scrotum, why do these patients usually have no pain? Um, or patients with cardiac edema and or venous edema, why do these patients usually have no pain? Um, if edema, if fluid would really be the cause of the patient's pain, these patients must be under treatment with morphine. And we all know this is not the case. And furthermore, in general, ladies and gentlemen, what fluid, what edema, what role does the edema actually play in this disease lipidema? Now, this question is essential because this, in my view, non-existent fluid is the reason the patients demand and get MLD. Indeed, there is no science, serious science evidence for this fluid in lipidema. Now let's go a bit deeper. Edema are by definition fluid accumulation. This is a lymphedema, not a lipidema leg. This is a lymphedema leg. And you can find fluid or, uh, by pitting edema or by high resolution ultrasonography of the soft tissue. And personally, I see far more than 1,000 lipidema patients per year. But I must assert none of my pure lipidema patients present significant edema. This is the, the black spots here, this uh, is the, the, the edema. Now let me illustrate this issue with this patient. This is a patient suffering from three diseases. First one is morbid obesity. And this is, and I have to emphasize, it's not a matter of fall, this is a disease. Then lipidema of the thigh and the proximal um, lower leg, this is the area where the patient suffer from pain and obesity related lymphedema of the distal lower leg. We can see here the the um, stasis term dermatitis. And um, we can see the sustaining pitting in the area, so in the, in the area of the lymphedema, um, the lower circle, but non, the non-pitting nature of the, um, in the area where the patients are from lipidema, the upper cycle. Now by means of the ultra, no, sorry, by means of the ultrasound, we see fluid in the area of the lymphedema, the dark spots in this patient, but no fluid in the soft tissue of the legs from, from, the, from this patient diagnosed with lipidema. So in the area where the patient suffered from the pain. Now, few American colleagues wrote to me that this um, edema is not visible by, by fluids. Okay, then let's have a look to other methods. What about MRI lymph angiography, which is very sensitive regarding fluid. Now in a new study by Selena and her group, lipidema patients were investigated by MRI lymph angiography. And they concluded the fat tissue was homogenous without any signs of edema in pure lipidema. Now, um, quite often, particularly from the United States, you will hear that lipidema is a lymphatic disease, which could lead to lymphedema. 
for instance, my highly respected colleague, Dr. Roxton, who also believed that lipedema is a lymphatic problem. And Dr. Roxton stated, um, we also showed this picture here, that he has found a biomarker for lipedema. Now, this video here is from a lipedema webinar and reveals the problem with this statement. In this short video clip, Dr. Roxon says two sentences, and may I ask you for your attention. Very, very similar. This patient has lipedema, and it takes a trained clinician to be able to distinguish the two. Now, now I agree with the second sentence of Dr. Roxon. It takes a trained clinician to be able to distinguish between lymphedema and lipedema. But I disagree with his first sentence. We don't know whether this patient is a, uh, has lipedema. The two main criteria to give the diagnosis lipedema are disproportional fat tissue of the legs compared with the upper part of the body, as well as having complaints like pain in the fat tissue. But on this picture, we can't see the upper part of the body. Moreover, and what is obvious is that this patient suffered from lymphedema and it stays as dermatitis. And I guess this is a patient who probably will suffer from obesity-induced lymphedema, maybe additional with lipedema. And of course, I believe that the biomarker for lymphatic insufficiency is increased in patients like these. But let me emphasize this lymphatic insufficiency is not due to lipedema. This is really essential. Now to emphasize this point, um, at, uh, to, um, at the Ferdinand Clinic, we see daily patients like these, patients who suffer from three diseases. The first one is obesity, which it's, a matter, it's not a matter of fault, it's a disease, very important. Second, lipedema. Um, and um, you see here the, the disproportional fat tissue and um, lymphedema. But this lymphedema is not caused by lipedema, which is often claimed, but by the obesity. This is an obesity associated lymphedema. We know very well the pathophysiology for this development. And of course, a biomarker for lymphatic insufficiency will be high in these patients. Um, for those who have deeper interest in this pathophysiology, I refer to an article which I published in 2018. Now, of course, there are patients who suffer from two diseases, from obesity plus lipedema. And the question for clinicians, and that's what, what Andre Schuber just mentioned, the question is not Andre lipedema or obesity. The huge majority of our patients suffer from both diseases, from lipedema plus obesity. And um, um, we have a strong evidence that approximately 85% of our patients um, are obese and around 50% are morbid obese, which means they have a BMI more than 40. And as mentioned, obesity is a disease, not a matter of fault. I can't emphasize this, uh, emphasize this, this not enough. When you treat the disease obesity, for instance, by periodic surgery, you will also treat the lipedema. This patient now is free of complaints at the further clinic, we call this lipedema in remission. And um, we see now nearly daily patients who experience a remarkable amount of weight loss, mostly after bariatric surgery, at the same amount, the remarkable, remarkable amount of volume reduction of the legs and of course, a remarkable improvement of their um, lipedema. Um, to evaluate our clinical experience together with the University of Freiburg, we conducted a study about the impact of bariatric surgery of volume of the thigh of patients with lipedema. Because please note many experts will tell you that weight loss has no impact on lipedema. In fact, the opposite is true. As you can see here, the volume on the, on the thigh at the y-axis and the, after search, the time after surgery, first year, second year, on the x-axis. And patients with lipedema um, lost the same amount of volume in the thigh as the control group, even a bit more. To visualize this, have just a look at the picture on the right side. This was the patient 10 months later. Now, in um, contrary to Dr. Roxon's view that lipedema is a lymphatic disease, it's also this study from Epagis Populus from the University of Zurich. If I examined the tissue of patients with lipedema with molecular pathophysiological methods, and he concluded, as you can see here, no morphological changes in the lymphatic component are present in lipedema. Contrary to Dr. Roxon's views, also the international study by Felmerweit from the University of Göttingen. 
histological evaluation of the lymphatic vessel using three distinct lymphatic markers. You can see here the three distinct lymphatic markers revealed no changes in number, size, and percent coverage of the lymphatic vessels between the, between the, the lipidema patients and the, and the control group. And their conclusion, no apparent lymphatic anomaly underlies lipidema. Now this sentence is very essential, providing evidence for the different disease nature in comparison to lymphedema. So please note, lipidema and lymphedema are completely different diseases. Of course, they can occur simultaneously, like you sometimes have patients with, let's say, diabetes and hypertension. But I think you will agree, these are completely different diseases. So please, for, for this reason, please forget the term lipolymphedema. Lipolymphedema suggests that lipidema leads to lymphedema. Lipolymphedema suggests that lipidema is the cause of lymphedema but we do not have any science evidence, scientific evidence for these popular statements. At the Ferley Clinic, we never use this term um, for, for years. Now, um, contrary to Dr. Roxon's views, also this great study by René Hegeling from the Charité in Berlin. And René won several science prizes for developing the Viper method. Um, uh, Viper is a great imaging technique to visualize tissue structures in a in a three-dimensional way. And um, he concluded no characteristic changes of the lymphatics in lipidema um, compared to the control group. And to give you an example of Viper, now this is the this is the control group, healthy patient, healthy lymphatics. And this is the a patient with stage two lymphedema. You see the disrupted, non-connected vessel fragments, the congestion of the, lip, um, of the lymphatics. And this is the patient with lipidema, beautiful, healthy lymphatics. Now, after all this consistent evidence, who among you still believe that lipidema is edema disease? Who among you still believes that lipidema is a lymphatic disease, a lymphatic disease which can lead to lymphedema? And who among you still believe that lipidema should be treated by decongestion by MLD? Now, let me respond to the statement with the um, former um, ISL president Santo Mussolini from Italy. It's not possible to drain cells. Uh, no manual lymphatic drainage is very low, the, the clinical effect. is uh, a placebo, placebo uh, effect, the manual lymphatic drainage in, in this subject. Now you should know now there is no lip, um, edema and lipidema, therefore we think lipidema and ladies and gentlemen, that is the reason why we needed this paradigm shift. Act two. Now, this paradigm shift, lipidema is first and foremost a perspective change, a perspective change away from that what oncologists believe to see in the last decade, which, which is an edema, which is a lymphatic insufficiency, which needs decongestion. Um, Trots an appreciation to the real complaints, to the real suffering of our patients. And only if you are able to change our perspective, only if we are able to change, to, to see the real suffering, the real misery of our patients, only then will we be able to be, to provide an effective treatment, which is also successful in the long term. Now, um, what are the, um, what are the, um, the, the real complaints of our patients? At the first glance, fat legs and pain, at least this is what our patients tell us. And um, I have to emphasize, these are the major criteria. Fat legs, disproportional fat tissue in the legs and pain, these are the major criteria. Indeed, and I think everyone who treat patients with lipidema probably will confirm that the complaints of our patients are much more complex. Um, I already mentioned um, that, and Andre um, mentioned the two that, oh, sorry, that around 85% of our patients are obese. Um, so the question is not lipidema or obesity. It's, may they have two diseases, lipidema plus obesity. And um, when they are obese, they suffer from a poor fitness. Our data from the Ferdinand Clinic we published a few months ago said that around 75% um, suffer from a poor, from an under average physical fitness. And it's another issue of our patients. And our patients are from mental pain and disorders. According to our study, we did at the Ferdinand Clinic, um, 
um, around a little bit in my pain, 80% of our patients display mental stress and disorders. Um, like depression, eating disorder, chronic stress disorder, post-traumatic uh, disorder. But please note, this mental issue already existed before the lipedema complaints, like pain in the leg started. So purely in terms of formal logic, something that temporarily precedes the development of lipedema cannot be its consequence. In other words, usually it's not lipedema, which leads to mental issues of our patients. In fact, the opposite is true, obesity stigmatization, previously existing psychological issues and social pressure on account of our current beauty ideal contributes to an essential amount to this disease we call lipidema. And let me give you an idea with this um, picture here. This poll represents the diagnosis of lipidema. Lipidema as a diagnosis um, offers a reasonable explanation for all these problem areas, quite often these are tragedies in the life of our patients. And of course, our patients suffer from pain in the soft tissue, but this pain is strongly dependent on the mental, um, on the psychological situation of our patients because of the increased pain perception we see, for instance, in patients with depression. They suffer, as mentioned, from weight gain, more than 80% are obese, suffer from poor fitness, as mentioned, and um, they suffer from the stigmatization because obesity is quite often stigmatized not at least by doctors, by medical doctors, by the way, and they suffer from a lack of self-acceptance because of the current beauty idea. Now, beside all, ladies and gentlemen, one thing is clear. Edema or lymphatic insufficiency is definitely not the reason of the suffering of our patients. Now, um, in 2018 and 19, I invited lipidema experts from several European countries um, several professions like physiotherapists, specialized nurses, medical doctors, obesity experts, psychologists, surgeons to come together in Hamburg to, to Germany. And all attendees are renowned experts in this field like Christine Mufford, Christiana Gordon, Robert Damstra, and many others. In the meantime, also very well-known other colleagues um, are part of this uh, Libidim Forum, like Harker Drossen from Sweden, um, or Miguel Amor, the new president of the ISL, or um, Neil Piller from Australia. And let me emphasize that I feel privileged to work with these outstanding colleagues in this project. And with a focus on the real complaints of our patients with lipidema, with a focus on real suffering, a consensus document has been worked out, which was published in October 2020, and high-ranking experts from now 15 European countries, as well from experts beyond Europe, support and spread this consensus document. And I'm very happy and I feel honored that Professor Parch, the world leading phlebologist, many call him the compression, the, the, the compression pope, agreed to write the foreword of the international consensus document. And I quote from his, um, from his, um, um, from, from his foreword, he wrote, lipidema neither includes edema nor is there any scientific evidence for lymphatic insufficiency. Act three, now what should change over the next few years? First and foremost, we should stop disinformation, misinformation, and half-truths um, uh, around this disease we call lipidema and what we quite often hear also from several patient support groups. We should distinguish between fact and fake, between science-based information and misinformation. Or to say it in the words of Joe Biden during a debate about lipidema at the US Congress. We need some straight talk right now. Because there's a lot of fear and misinformation in the country. And we need to cut through it with facts, with science, with the truth. And um, we have to, um, to focus on the real suffering of our patients, which is not edema, but which is peace. Now, um, these are, this is the therapeutic uh, concept of the International Con um, Expert Group and the therapeutic approach is focused on the real complaints, on the real suffering of our patients and not on edema. And let me, and the detailed explanation of this therapy pillars you can find in the national consensus document. And let me emphasize that movement therapy and compression therapy play a key role in this, um, in this concept. Now, um, let me finish um, as Act 3 with a personal question, a personal question which, which I can't get out of my head. I know our patients suffer from pain, pain in the soft tissue of the legs. 
But do you really think we would be talking about liberty much today if the current ideal of beauty would not be this, but this? Epilogue, short epilogue now. Every good player has an epilogue, my lecture too. <laughs> I'm aware, I'm aware there are a few who believe, still believe in the old law of liberty. I'm aware there are a few who believe or to insist to walk on the old way. But those folks should know old ways won't open doors, particularly when this old way is far away from science and particularly when this old way is way far away from the real suffering of our patients. But much has already changed and uh, I would like to emphasize this. For example, the um, German Liberty Mark guidelines have been reformed currently and several German members of the European Liberty Mark Forum are part of this guideline commission. Moreover, then the national consensus document, which was published last year in the British Journal of Wound Care, um, is now supported and spread by European, by, by, by experts from 15 European countries, as well as from experts from Australia, Canada, United States, and, and Argentina. And moreover, the paradigm shift and the international consensus has been widespread at many prestigious national and international conferences like the World Confer Conference, uh, the ISL conference last September, uh, where I spoke about this, um, this, this the, the paradigm shift. In a few weeks, the ILF in, Rotter in, in Copenhagen will take place, um, which is also the, the, the um, paradigm shift is also a um, very central point and the same in, at, the, at the ALA conference in Australia. Moreover, um, at the third the national third in the National Liberty Mark Forum, which I'm organizing currently and which will take place in four weeks in Copenhagen, one aim will be to be to extend the forum to an international Liberty Mark Association. So we change from a European to an international society in 50 founding members from 15 European countries as well as beyond Europe um, um, agreed. Um, to this consensus and to this Liberty Mark Association, and all of them are renowned experts in this field. This is my last slide, and um, um, last but not least, but uh, this fact makes me really, really happy. At the Furley Clinic, which is the European center of lymphology in Germany, we already treat our patients with Liberty Mark strictly according to the international consensus document. And our first results are very promising, what you can see. Um, in, in this patient. Now let me finish this talk with the credo of the Feldman Clinic. This is what we believe as a result of our first experiences with these new concepts. We say at the Feldman Clinic, we don't only treat our patients with lipidema, we make a difference in their lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobias, for your presentation. I really like uh, the different views that exist uh, in regard to, to uh, different approaches. Um, I think for, for, uh, for me, uh, it's really important that um, finally the patient is, is benefiting most from, from all the, the research that is done and uh, that we have uh, real solutions for the patients that suffer really from this disease also. Um, before we come to the questions, I would just quickly ask you once again to show the poll questions. Um, the question is, patients who are diagnosed, diagnosed with lipedema often suffer from A, edema, B, weight gain, mostly obesity, C, psychological problems, or D, B and C are correct. Um, so please make your choices. Uh, we will see the result then afterwards. Sergio, uh, I think I hand over to you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and I will virtually fly to Turkey with Professor Borman and to Poland with Professor Tsuba. Would you have some comments? If not, I have mine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to Tobias uh, for this nice presentation. I completely agree with Tobias because in our clinical practice, uh, we always see complex patients, not uh, with pure lipedema, which may uh, change your, um, uh, your point of view to the uh, disease. Uh, as Tobias uh, has emphasized, I also believe, uh, like him, there's no edema, there's no lymphedema in uh, pure 
lipedema patients. But of course, if the patient uh, has venous insufficiencies or maybe very uh, advanced cases, uh, may have uh, be uh, may have be uh, assessed like. Uh, like lymphedema component, having lymphedema component. And as Tobias has um, uh, emphasized again, lipolymphedema is a wrong uh, nomination. Uh, Lipoalgology, I think lipo, uh, uh, lipo, uh, algology and lip, lip, lip and uh, pain can be uh, come together uh, in my opinion. And uh, for the pain uh, that is in lipedema patients, we are now performing a study in lipedema patients uh, addressing the presence of fibromyalgia. Uh, fibromyalgia, uh, you know, it's a, a, a syndrome uh, with multiple components and uh, pain has uh, multiple um, um, per, uh, perspectives uh, that can be um, uh, seen in one patient. And we believe that in our study, uh, we will find that uh, painful lipedema patients will have uh, more uh, fibromyalgia uh, characteristics. In other words, uh, pain perception is very different and can be um, uh, can appear in different conditions. And in pain, the pain in lipedema patients, I believe, uh, depends on their uh, psychological disorders at the, at the background. Because in our clinical practice, we do not always see pain in uh, some of our uh, lipedema patients. Uh, as a characteristic properties, pain is present, but some patients really do not have of pain pure lipedema patients I talk about. And uh, that's another uh, point of view. And I think further studies are needed to uh, highlight these, uh, these uh, properties of uh, lipedema uh, in the future with more um, uh, very uh, qualified uh, studies with uh, big study groups. Thank you. Let's fly now to Poland. Yeah. Tobias, it's a great talk. And uh, well, I would like to agree with you, but uh, not necessarily in everything. Uh, I think it's a, a little bit preliminary to say that uh, lipedema is not lymphatic disease. Why? Because uh, first we know that lymph stasis leads to accumulation on fat. We know also that in even in pure obesity, we see just dysfunctional lymphatics and slow, slower lymph flow. So, and the old concept of lymphatic insufficiency in lipedema, actually shown by Stan in one of the slides, was showing that there are leaky lymphatics. So we are, so what, what is my point that the anatomical description of normal lymphatics in lipedema is not enough. It, it might be still lymphatic disease, but because of dysfunctional lymphatics and some problems with function. Again, in any models, there's close connection with, between lymphatics and lymphatic system and fat, fat deposition. So it might be, it is not lymphedema, but the relationship might it still might be there and it might be different. So <laughs> we, we still don't know. <laughs> the, the, the anatomy is not everything. <laughs> and um, another thing is that term lipolymphedema. I know that you always say it's wrong. Well, it's the, 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 the statement comes from clinicians and we see patients who have column-shaped legs with calf sign, with pain, with bruising, but also with hump on their feet and stemmer sign, and they all are obese. So it's very easy to call them to lipolymphedema because they share clinical features of both of lipedema and lymphedema. So it comes from the clinic. Well, maybe we shouldn't use this term, but it's, it will be difficult because 
these patients are there. Would you like to comment on this, Tobias? Yes. Um, um, thanks for your comment, Andre. Um, uh, now, if, if you if you um, like the term lipolymphedema and you would use this further, then I think you 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 also don't say if a patient has hypertension and diabetes, you don't say hyperdiabetes or anything. Yes. Are, and as my point is to to emphasize that these are completely different diseases. So this. This um, this concept or this term is not really helpful. And regarding your point with lymphatic insufficiency, we know from a great paper from from Robert Dunstor from from the Netherlands that also people who don't have lymphedema suffer from lymphatic insufficiency. There are many points who have an impact on the lymphatics, like um, chronic venous insufficiency, obesity, and more than eighty percent are obese or aging. We know that our lymphatics are aging and um, experience a reduced lymphatic capacity. So, of course, you will see um, also patients who have, who have suffered from lipidema and additional have a lymphatic insufficiency. But this has nothing to do with lipidema because you probably will find also like in, a, in a group with, who, with patients who don't suffer from lipidema, you will find lymphatic, lymphatic insufficiency. And the third and most important point we should focus on the suffering of our patients, which is the pain, the obesity, the fitness level, the, 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 the obesity stigmatization, and not on any theoretical lymphatic insufficiency, which really doesn't play any role for this patient. Only, be, only because you are a lymphologist, you want to treat, you want to treat this lymphatic insufficiency. I think we should be try to think outside of the box and focus on the suffering of our patients. This is essential. Uh, yes, I, I, I think I, this. I would like. I, just one comment. I don't want to go that far that I want to treat lymphatic insufficiency with patients with lipedema. It's not that way. Yeah, I seem to want to say that we don't know pathophysiology of lipedema yet. We don't know what is the background of this disease. We know that uh, Sandro Michelini found that in one family in, in Italy, there is. Uh, Aldo reductase uh, 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 mutation, gene, mut gene mutation, and it's genetic because of, uh, uh, and definitely some hormonal issues are there. We still will learn and we'll find out what is this. I agree and I told uh, 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 with everybody that treating uh, MLD and treating lymphatic insufficiency in lipedema does not makes, uh, make any sense. But still, uh, we need further studies to find out what is really the, what the, the disease really is. That's, that's when the moderator comes into play because we need to keep the time. And uh, indeed, I see that for being gentlemen, we will allow Pilar to make a last uh, comment on this and then uh, we move forward. Pilar, would you like to, to make, you are raising your hand for a second, Pilar? Yeah, I, I would like uh, to add that a uh, comment uh, about lymphocentigraphies. If it's the lymphatic disease, lymphocentigraphies should be pathologic. But I have read many papers on uh, assessing the lymphocentigraphy in patients with lipedema. None of them had pure lipedema patients uh, or uh, unnominated patients. Uh, they don't know uh, the inclusion criteria and ex ex exclusion criteria were not uh, enough uh, to put a definite uh, lipedema diagnosis is another point, I think. And for the treatment uh, sequences, uh, in our clinical practice, we have seen many patients. We are not performing a CDT, MLD especially, sorry, uh, for um, uh, lipedema, but uh, it may help only the pain, only the pain component, but not to the uh, edema or not to the volume of their legs uh, uh, as a treatment option. Thank you so much, Pinar. I think we agree on disagreeing. If I can give my contribution as well, uh, I think it's clearly evident the ecogenicity is different in these patients. And this is clearly related to the fluid component. I don't think we really need to stuck into a closed box of concepts for which we really need to separate the two of them. We could just call it lymphopathy because at the moment we just know that there is a disease 
of the uh, uh, lipid component. At the same time, I really congratulate uh, Tobias for focusing on uh, the importance of staying away from fake news. That's exactly what we are doing for the next Dubai event with the Win Foundation. But at the same time, I'd like to ask you, but maybe you'll put that into the chat because time is flying. How can we rely really in the literature? Because Pinar now was talking about lymphocentigraphy, but the amount of confounding factors that we have in these patients, obesity, issues, uh, for example, in terms of postural defects. So I would kindly disagree with Pinar in calling it in a way that is related to our symptoms. We cannot put pathophysiology with a symptoms that is so bearable. So a lot of things to discuss, I think, and uh, we have a giant with us, Stan, so you have a raised hand. Maybe the last word is yours, and then we go to the survey. You have, you have to unmute yourself. Um, sorry, um, I wanted to bring up a point from um, an older aspect of the literature, which actually captured my attention early in my career, which is that um, there was a clinical test that I think has some utility that was performed uh, in earlier days, which is assessing the, the ability of the patient to excrete a water load. And basically, uh, the individuals who are tested are given a defined um, uh, amount of fluid ingestion. They maintain upright posture for four hours and urinary excretion of the water load is quantitated over time. It's a very, you know, very rudimentary scientific approach, but it, 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 it is looking at something uh, beyond pure descriptive uh, uh, morphology of patients. And there is a literature to uh, demonstrate uh, the fact that patients with lipedema early in the course of their disease in fact, have an impaired ability to clear uh, an ingested water load, suggesting, as Andre um, says, and which I also believe that there is a defect uh, in uh, lymphatic function, which is independent of um, collecting vessel dysfunction, independent of the presence of obesity and the other factors that we're talking about in this very heterogeneous patient population. And I think my plea would be whether we believe this is going to fall on one side or another of this dividing line, that we go beyond morphometrics and, and, and symptoms and appearances and focus on mechanisms. And as I've said, the failure of having an animal model system or a cell culture medium in which to look at the particulars of this means that we have to get much more sophisticated in being able to look at these patients mechanistically in the human clinical setting, which is going to be hybrid. Uh, there are going to be comorbidities. And we what we need to do is to design studies in which we segregate the various um, um, phenomena such that we can look at the individual component that we want. At the end of the day, we under, need to understand genetics. We need to understand pathogenesis, and we need to understand uh, molecular mechanisms to know really what is this disease and why is it different than obesity? What is it about lipedema that makes it distinct? My, my bias continues to be that there is a lymphatic substrate that is not present in the same manner in either lymphedema or in obesity, but uh, one way or another, we need to understand that. Thank you so much, Stan, for the vision from the top of the hill. And thank you so much, Tobias, for a brilliant contribution. Tobias, you invoked the evidence base and the scientific writing. So you will have a lot of things to write in the question and answer box, where you have eight questions to answer in a written form, if you can. So please go back to the audience by digiting your answers. And now we go over to Sylvain for the poll. Thanks a lot, Sergio. Um, Khaled, can we see the results, maybe? Okay, um, the right answer was uh, answer D. So uh, most of the attendees have uh, selected the right uh, answer. So I think also from this side, not really a sur surprise uh, for, the, for the expert panel. Thank, thank you, Sylvain. Now thank we fly you. on the way to Australia for uh, a splendid representative of the Adina Institute of uh, Sig Paris, uh, clinical manager, Suzanne Butcher, telling us about what uh, she think we should do with compression for these patients. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. Um, I just want to say I'm very honoured to be a part of this uh, amazing panel. And also I feel probably being the only clinician that's actually treating many lipedema patients. So I hope you enjoy this uh, brief presentation on garments. 
I'll take it over. Yep. Hi everyone, I'm Susan Butcher, Clinical Manager and Practicing Lymphedema Therapist here at the Edema Institute in Melbourne, Australia. I'm very excited to be able to present um, my brief presentation on lipedema and correct garment use. I know possibly over the time there's been a lot said about um, diagnosing for lipedema and how to manage their condition but I feel as a practicing therapist that little is actually known around the garment choices for this condition. We've only really understood about the lipedema uh, patients probably in the last 10 to 15 years and I believe as a clinician myself a lot of health professionals have still put them in the same basket as uh, lymphedema. And we've got to just remember that these patients aren't lymphedema patients. Some may have lipolymphedema, but underneath there's still lipedema patients and we have to be really mindful of what type of garments we're actually putting these patients into. Starting with this first slide, we've got a patient who was fitted into thigh high with waist attachment. Now there's a measuring issue with the actual groin piece where the thigh piece is not actually going up to the groin or the panty line where it should be, but also the slippage that's happening with the garment is actually slipping down and then causing a massive uh, pressure area through the ankle. And this is always something that we're going to face with these lipedema patients. So this is a circular knit garment and it's possibly not the most appropriate garment for a lipedema patient. In this image, I just wanted to highlight the problems that evolve when we put patients into below knee garments for lipedema. So we've still got the same problem happening at the ankle. This is a circular knit garment, so it's biting in around the ankle joint. But more importantly, it's the problems that are developing around the knee. So over a period of time, we would continually just have the knee getting larger. There'd be more fat depositing on the inner sides of the knee. And if this was the case, then we would definitely look at putting this patient into a flat knit garment uh, just to prevent the further problems that we would occur down the track. So in this image is to at the end, we've got the patient now into a flat knit garment and you can just see the better shape that's happening at the ankles and also just the nice flow that's happening right up through into the abdomen area. In this image, we've still got the same problem, but instead of being at the knees, it's at the saddlebag thigh area. So the garments have been worn for a substantial amount of time. As you can see, it's actually formed a shape where the garments actually go up to, but over the period of the day, it's slipping down into the ankle creases again. This is a circular knit garment, and it's leaving that saddlebag area now forming more fat deposit. So we placed the patient into a custom made flat knit garment and over about a three, four week period, you started to see that saddlebag starting to change and it's starting to form a better shape. This is an advanced case of lipedema. And in the second image, you've got the stockings that she was currently wearing when she came into the clinic, which was just purchased I believe from a chemist um, and this is just a flight class one type of stocking. So you can see the problems that um, inappropriate stockings and garments can cause in this situation. I did put her into a Compraflex wrap just to try and get some shape and continuity back into the limb because of what had happened with the middle garment um, and then we were able to put her into appropriate flat knit garments that was more suitable for her needs. We do face many challenges when placing patients who are larger sized into suitable garments. We have compliancy issues and also that comfort level for the patient as well. This is just another garment which isn't medical compression. It works on a micro massage effect 
and it's a complete uh, garment which goes up underneath the bust and ends there at the toes. So you can see in the image it comfortably goes over all the skin folds without cutting in and also that comfortable level there over the ankle due to the cuffing. So this is just another way we can utilise another type of garment to help fit these more challenging patients. I've highlighted some of the more severe cases, but this is also a lipedema patient and we do see a lot of these patients come in and they have got obviously a few more options that they could look at for garment use. But this was a patient who come in in a, a legging that was medical grade compression and it's just a different style of compression that we could use. But unfortunately, the legging only went to the ankle and you can see the indentations that have been left around the ankle through the garment use. So she says when she wears it just for only half an hour or more, she starts to get a throbbing ache around the ankle. So again, even though the lipedema is not extensive here, it still has to be very carefully thought about what garment to put this patient in. So I would be putting a patient like this into a full garment, which would be open toe, closed toe, but I wouldn't end at the ankle. And um, it could certainly be um, a flat knit garment. I wouldn't put this patient into a circular knit garment because of the tendency to go in around the ankle. I thought it was appropriate now that we're talking about lipedema and uh, appropriate garments to place patients into, to just talk a little bit about the measuring of garments. So this is where it becomes really complicated, especially for these odd shaped limbs. And in the first image, you can see where we've carefully mapped out all the measurement areas that we want to do in this limb. And specifically challenging is at the ankle where you've got a lot of cuffing. You're obviously not doing the traditional um, measuring at the ankle, you're actually bringing that measurement point up 10 centimetres just above the ankle line where it normally would be to accommodate someone with cuffing. So it's not an easy exercise to measure someone who's got lipedema. And even in the second image, her gait position had changed significantly. So she had quite a drop in the left side of her hip and quite high in the right side and just with the measurements that we need to do over those areas is quite challenging as well. So I just wanted to highlight even the trickiness in measuring these patients for the most appropriate garment, but very worthwhile when you can get the whole sequence right. In this last slide, I'd just like to highlight the effects of a garment when we do get it right and put a patient, especially a lipedema patient, into the most appropriate garment. So you can see here around the bottom and even through the legs and the abdomen, just how comfortable and well fitting that this garment appears. She's also reported that she has reduced pain, she has more mobility, and that helps with all her daily function. And she wears this garment every day. Also, I'd like to just mention that all the garments that you've seen in the presentation are all really good products. Um, so it's not actually the product that is a problem, it's just the way that the products are being uh, put on or chosen for these patients. So we, that's where as therapists and health professionals, we just have to be very mindful, especially around lipedema issues, just what we actually put these patients in. In summary, I feel the best garments possibly for lipedema patients would be your flat knit garment or the custom made garment, which both garments would need to be pantyhose garments. Um, if they were a type two, which is only going down to the knee, you could get away with that circular knit garment because you wouldn't be worried about the cuffing at the ankles. But most of the time, I think the, the go-to would be a pantyhose style, either in a flat knit or a custom made. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present at the MOH, and I leave myself available now for any questions.
Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Susan, <laughs> for the presentation. Um, for, for me, really extremely interesting, the different aspects also of the presentations and, and also show, seeing that uh, there is a, even a third uh, important aspect that, uh, that uh, um, shows us uh, how complex this disease is and, and uh, that uh, there is even an, another layer of, of, of uh, points that need to be uh, respected and, 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 and taken into account uh, to give the right treatment to the patients. Yeah. Um, I think too um, that I'm very impressed with what um, Dr. Birch has um, commented because as a clinician, we're here to just help the patients for what we see. And even with the garments, it's very challenging when patients come in with incorrect garment wear. So that can really affect the progression and that comfort level and how the patients feel and respond. So, and also at the Institute, we don't do any MLD treatments on lipedema patients. We do quite a firm massage because with our SOZO readings with the bioimpedance, we see very minimal fluid in lipedema. It's more tissue related, which we have a specific style of massage to break that tissue up along with multi lasers that have, we've done our trials with as well. Uh, I think we have a, a last poll question for the audience. Okay, uh, the question is, when would you put a lipedema patients into flat knit garment instead of circle knit garments? You have four choice, choices, uh, patients having skin folds at odd shaped of limbs, the larger buttock and side, cuffing at ankles, leaving a torque effect or all above. Perfect. So. Now, again, uh, we are gentlemen, uh, Professor Tsuba, so we start with Turkey, if it is uh, fine for you. And uh, so we go to Professor Pilar for some comments. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, Susan for her nice presentation. Uh, the prescription of uh, pressure garments is really a challenging condition for clinicians because there are several different types of uh, lipedema patients, not only one type. And uh, as she has said, uh, the complicated patients, advanced lipedema stages or skin falls and extra, uh, we always uh, should uh, prescribe um, custom-made and uh, flat-knit garments. And we, in clinical practice, we uh, always uh, do prescriptions in this way. Uh, but in uh, mild cases, uh, for example, uh, young uh, patients with uh, thin patients, not obese patients, uh, we uh, can prescribe also uh, on the shelf uh, uh, pressure garments uh, for them. Uh, I would like to emphasize another um, point about the uh, compression garments in lipedema. What uh, will be the pressure level? Uh, this is an important uh, consideration also for our uh, clinical practice, because in our clinical practice, uh, I always check uh, the um, venous insufficiency uh, with Doppler ultrasonography in my patients because most, most of them are obese patients or having uh, clinical clues uh, indicating the venous uh, component. And according to the presence of uh, venous, uh, uh, venous insufficiency, I uh, prescribe them, for example, CCL2, if they have venous insufficiency, uh, and for L, Clearly, very painful patients, CCL1 uh, is enough uh, for easy donning of and don't don't don don off uh, of their uh, pressure uh, garments. I think it's another uh, discussion uh, point. I don't know uh, what the other experts in this area would comment on uh, the pressures, uh, but in our clinical practice, uh, we uh, we uh, decide the uh, pressure levels levels in this way. And uh, I believe that compression garments is uh, the only way 
the unique and only way of compression uh, treatment in these patients because in our clinical practice uh, we do not perform a bandaging to lipedema patients because it's not uh, in our according to our practice it's not useful and therefore uh, the main component of therapy is uh, one of the main components of therapy is compression garments uh, as it reduces inflammation uh, reduces pain and other symptoms of uh, lipedema and supports the tissues that will enable the patient uh, to perform their daily activities in an easy uh, way. And uh, I believe this should be always a part of the uh, treatment uh, in patients with uh, lipedema. Circular knit can be used in mild cases uh, with good shape, uh, uh, with good shaped legs. Uh, but the others uh, should always be custom made and flat knitted. I think too, that's why we use more the custom made garments. The, some of the, most of those images were custom made in the flat knit because more importantly, rather than talking about um, CCL class two and one, we actually more need to work with the comfort level of the lipedema patient. And that's why we do such close measuring and specific measuring. So we've got a garment that the patient's going to be compliant to wear because we know pain's a factor, we know mobility's a factor, and we have to take that into consideration when we're actually measuring a patient up. So that's where the custom made is actually probably slightly better because we can gauge basically the comfort level for that patient. Thank you so much. We fly now to Poland, Professor Tsuba. Oh, uh, Susan, thanks for the nice presentation. And uh, well, you, you pointed out the problems that we all have with these patients. And definitely the uh, custom made garments are garments of choice for these complicated patients. However, in um, older, uh, older women with uh, severe lipedema, uh, we can even measure well the garment, but the, they have so much difficulties putting them on and off that, uh, that they don't wear it. So we rather, in those patients, we go, uh, go for wraps, as you showed in one of your patients. So, uh, and this wrapping is actually uh, quite good, a quite good solution. Uh, for younger people uh, with, who are not obese, for younger women who are not obese, and also don't have too much money because this custom made garment in Poland are very expensive. Uh, I, and are not reimbursed by um, insurance. Uh, so I advise them to use uh, sport leggings. Uh, where compress uh, compression garments for, for, for running are quite popular and these are quite good. And they, they advise them to wear them and to exercise in those garments and uh, for early stages in lip of lipedema and younger people. Uh, who are not obese, it's, uh, it's also a quite good solution. So, so I would make a comment as well, Susan, congratulations for the, splen for the splendid um, uh, talk. Uh, just some questions. For me, compression is like a drug. It's not just a physical force. It's like an anti-inflammatory drug. And when we are prescribing a drug, we are choosing about the different dosages and we are always focusing on millimeter mercury but we are not talking that much about the stiffness. So do you envision a potential role, for example, in adjustable compression wraps in these patients as well to change a little bit the stiffness, if not by bandaging, and if not eventually by other form of compressions that we actually yes. have that are fundamental and that are actually far more powerful in terms of millimeter mercury. And I'm talking simply about water, meaning that we publish papers of compression into the aquatic environment, meaning the, the water per se is a compression tool that raised up to 80 millimeter mercury. And what we noticed is that the compliance of these patients is actually increasing toward uh, compression stockings once they experience the compression effect of the water and then they understand how powerful compression can be. So I'd like to have your vision on this. And one last comment on the sleeves, meaning that we published a paper looking at the sleeves, uh, graduated compression stockings versus uh, the full stockings. Uh, showing no difference in terms of perceived exertion, but they were like prototypes, of course, with specific uh, features. And if this could be the case for uh, lipedema, or however you want to call the condition. 
That's a very good point too. And I know we do to customise, to get people used to compression, especially if they have not worn compression before, we can use the SIPC pumps, which is sequential intermediate pump compression. Um, that's very successful on very low pressures uh, just to customise them. Or there's a garment that I showed that was more a micro massage garment, and that's quite popular uh, before vascular surgery or just to get patients accustomed to wearing a, a more uh, suitable garment um, afterwards as well. So there are a lot of options out there, but that's a good point. And I'd like to throw this to all uh, the faculty of experts, because of course we have huge experts uh, with us. So how do you envision these things, for example, of changing stiffness a bit, eventually integrating adjustable compression wraps? or integrating protocols in the aquatic environment or integrating sleeves rather than just full stocking. I don't know if Andrew or somebody want to. So, uh, okay. Okay, sorry. Oh, Pina, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead, please. Yeah, we are getting to the end of the webinar. We might be oh, a little yeah. tired, but just last miles. I can, I, I, I think I, so, sorry, it's okay. I, I just to say one thing. Uh, I think we have to put the diagnose is very important. The patient is, uh, do the patient has pure lymphedema, lipedema? Do the patient have lipedema uh, uh, and uh, venous insufficiency, lipedema and lymphedema? And these uh, distinctions will make our clinical uh, decisions uh, more easily because every patient group has different characteristics. But uh, according to these um, explanations, I always talked with pure lipedema patients, but we have in clinical scenarios many, many patients. And our approaches are always, uh, are always change and uh, decisions are changed according to the situation of patient. Uh, for example, in lipedema and li lipedema patients, uh, wrapping is the best solution before the compression garments uh, or in venous sufficiency the pumps are maybe useful and extra thank you any other comment if not we go to the audience tobias you were raising the hand maybe yeah um, thank you for this really great talk and i completely agree with your approach at the Ferley clinic um, we also treat our patients with lipidema i would say 99.9 percent with flatness with custom-made flat knit um, stockings. And it's uh, in many cases, particularly when, when the patient is um, additional to the lipidema, also obese, which is um, the majority of when, when, they are, when they are severe obese, then it's challenging to, um, to, to make really great, great stockings for them that they can wear it every day. But um, I think compression is really the, compression and, and, and movement together, uh, both have the anti-inflammatory impact on the fat tissue. And for this reason, both parts, the movement, the exercise and the compression are the, 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 key, the, the key therapeutic tools in this treatment. And um, I think no, no one of, the, of this, uh, this woman would put on flat knit material every day. It's, it's by, by choice or by pleasure if they would not experience a pain relief, if they would not experience improvement of their disease. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, so if there are no other comments from uh, the panel, we can uh, go to the audience. Uh, and I see, Susan, you have some uh, questions here. One we already answered to uh, an anonymous um, attendees. Do you think Susan wraps could be an option in some case? I think we already got this one. So we go with uh, Nana Gresha. What is the goal, Susan, of compression garments with the lipedema patients? Strictly maintenance or also reduction? In reality, we already answered this. Possibly, we would like to aim for reduction before we'd actually put them into garments. But in saying that, most lipedema patients, if there's any superficial fluid, which might only be 10%, um, there we could get that down. But basically what we see in a lipedema patient would be what we're measuring. And that is when we go back to the comfort level of that patient. I've got patients who will go into class two measurements and I've got ones that 
excuse me, would have to uh, depressure to put them into something that would be at, like equivalent to a class one. Um, but yeah, so it's guided very much by the clinician and the patient. That is very interesting. So I don't because... think there's a set goal to say, well, we're just going to put all lipedemas into class two or all lipedemas into class one. That's very interesting because it's paving the way for a lot of discussion here, first of all, because uh, I wouldn't focus just on how many millimeter mercury and also focus on the fact that we have an indication, for example, to compression for whoever is at risk of developing swelling, even healthy subjects, we published about this. And we have a, an indication of 1B, even if the indication is coming not from a guideline, but from a consensus document. And this is a, an opportunity to stress out the importance of reading the literature properly. A lot of time, we refer to these documents as guidelines, where in reality, they are consensus documents, yet we have literature showing uh, this. So uh, I think that uh, my answer would have been, again, it's an anti-inflammatory drug, like that you're giving to somebody who is at risk of developing edema, if not already present, or for the other actions that compression does, including the hemodynamics effects. We know that hemodynamics effects requires another pressure level or another type of compression. So there is a lot of discuss here. And we see that uh, Andrew was Raising the hand, probably. Uh, a quick comment uh, uh, about the maintenance uh, compression garments. Uh, this uh, flat knitted or round knitted, uh, especially flat knitted compression garments are usually used for maintenance. They to use them. On the other hand, compression, continuous compression, will reduce any time of tissue. I'm not talking about swelling. If we compress the tissue for a long time, it will rearrange and will have like uh, wearing the ring on your finger, you can see that you have thinner fatty tissue. So we can use compression for reduction of fat also, but in, to do this, we have to have continuous compression and to change it quite often. So that's something that also Bro, uh, Hakan Brosson uh, does in his patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. I will take the chance of seeing Professor Roxon still with us. Uh, there is a, a question about uh, uh, lipedema happening just uh, in females or also in men. And take this chance to deeply thank Professor Roxon and all the panel for remaining until the end. We are all volunteers here, so I deeply thank all of you for having taken part in this uh, initiative. So, Stan, would you like to answer to this question from the audience? Does the lipedema happen just to females or also to males? I would say over 99% of lipedema is described as being seen in women, and it typically it correlates with hormonal stages within the female uh, experience, but uh, the most common pattern is onset at the time of puberty when hormonal levels rise. Um, to my knowledge, most of the cases of male described lipedema occur in settings in which there is an increase in prevailing estrogen levels, for example, in estrogen producing tumor or in uh, chronic liver disease where there is um, failure to detoxify uh, natural estrogens in the male and there is a, a tendency to um, uh, develop female attributes. So um, this is one of the unexplored areas, of course, in, in lipedema. Lipedema is a complex biological presentation and I think I will just go back again to what I said earlier, which is to say it, it's high time that we get uh, beyond the descriptive phase uh, of uh, practice for this, for this entity. We need to understand really what, how, how, what is the interplay of these forces? How do hormones interrelate with the genetic fabric that predisposes to uh, this condition? What is the role of inflammation? How does the uh, variability in adipose biology regionally, geographically within the body uh, play into the presentation of this entity? What is the role of the vascular connection to the adipose tissue and the maintenance of body fluids? All of these things are very complex and, and, and we need to develop the tools to be able to pull them apart so that we eventually are much smarter at taking care of these patients or maybe even preventing this condition one day. Thank you so much, Stan. It's 5.53 perfectly in Italy, so time to give the mic to Silben and wrap up, or like to put under compression stockings if you don't like the wraps as you prefer, everything. <laughs> Thank you, Sergio. I think we, we still have the, the feedback on the last poll question. Let's just to have yes. a look at that quickly. 
Okay, 87% for all the above. So um, also for you, Susan, your, re, uh, your presentation was well received and, and uh, everybody's uh, more or less in line with the, with the answer. So I can close that down. Um, I'm, I'm extremely impressed by the, by the presentations and I, I would really like to thank all the presenters and, and also the expert panel for these uh, extreme lively discussions. Um, it shows me how complex every, uh, the, the whole disease is and, and uh, um, I, I would have uh, been pleased to have uh, maybe also a patient invited to see also how complex it is, it is for the patients. Uh, uh, if, if we are discussing the, the disease on this level, uh, what does it mean exactly for the, for the patient that does not know exactly what he has? He is he's looking around for, for the appropriate treatment. But uh, it, it makes me also um, happy to see that we are all working into the same direction to, to provide the patients the best uh, possible treatment. And for that, uh, I'm, I'm extremely thankful to have you had all, all of you here and, and uh, presenting uh, these, you know, these uh, interesting discussions. Maybe Sergio, you have also a comment, last comment. Sure, I think uh, today we gave a perfect example of how many things we know that we know, how many things we know that we don't know, <laughs> and how many things we don't even know that we don't know. And for this, I'd like to deeply thank uh, on the stellar faculty, again, uh, spending two hours on a weekend uh, in a volunteer way. It's uh, something great. I think we are all committed to protect patients, first of all, but also industry from not certified products. And this is what we have been doing in the last two years, uh, approaching the Winter Dubai meeting that was uh, actually created because I read something incredible, but it is true and it is on PubMed. 40% of medical websites are including uh, fake news shared uh, in average 450,000 times. So I think it's our responsibility and that's why we are here today to really put a defense in front of that. And I think it's important we are more aware after these two hours that there is a new entity that is not new for sure, but uh, we are talking about that. That is uh, lipe, lipe, however you want to call it, uh, lipe pathology, let, let's say so. But for sure, edema is uh, the, I would say, Darwinian price we pay for being uh, not quadrupeds anymore, but bipeds. And I usually see indeed varicose veins and edema in the lower limbs, not that much in the upper arms. So it's the price of the evolution and uh, compression, of course, can help us uh, uh, fighting this, uh, this issue. Having said that, I deeply thank uh, Sigbaris for the opportunity and in particular the Sarah faculty for joining today. Great, thank, thank you very you. much, Sergio, uh, for your moderation and helping us going through this meeting so quickly and then uh, that will be on time. So we, we are at the end of the, of the meeting and uh, thank you once again to all the presenters and, and the expert panel. And uh, hopefully we see each other at uh, one of the next Congresses live, hopefully, and uh, maybe in one of the next uh, MOH uh, webinars once again. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And Bye. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a photograph. Did you take Sergio a photograph? I'm <laughs> not the organizer. Khaled, Khaled, can we do one? I Let's just data. ask Khaled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yes. Great. Thank you.